Hello, and welcome to another edition of Legislative Update here on Okemo TV. My name is Tom Ayer, Senior Staff Writer for the Vermont Standard Newspaper in Woodstock, and it's time for our weekly visit with Woodstock State Representative Tesha Buss. Hello, Tesha. Hi, Tom. Thanks for having me back. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, we're in the we're in the stretch run in the legislature now. Things are winding down probably to an, an early to mid-May uh, conclusion to this session. And I wanted to talk to you about three issues that were sort of hot button items this past week in the legislature, beginning with S-5, the Affordable Heat Act. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, about what the Affordable Heat is, uh, Heat Act is and what some of the... Um, uh, maybe the public misunderstandings a little bit of of, of what it will accomplish for people uh, in, in the coming times. Yes, absolutely. Uh, thank you for letting me share this. There is some complicating factors to this bill that makes it seem as if this standard will be enacted without any movement on the General Assembly, uh, but that is not true. So what this bill is, is it has the Public Utility Commission create a plan. And it does require all of the heating uh, distributors to create an account with the PUC. It does require a lot of information gathering so that they can inform the plan. So they come back to the legislature in February of next year, 2024, and they give us an update as to where they are. And then they will come back in January of 2025 with their final plan and report. It is then that it will go through the entire legislative process to see if that plan and how they have put all the implementation factors together, that then we will be able to look at it and see if we will enact it. And most likely we will make adjustments and, and stuff then. But we could say the plan's terrible and we're going to go back to the drawing board. Um, or we could say, yes, let's let's work with this. Uh, but right now, that's where we are. What well, what in essence would the plan accomplish once it once it is uh, enacted, once you go through this uh, careful review and then and then look at enacting something next session? What exactly would it uh, its primary intent be? So fuel dealers that sell fossil fuel, if they do nothing and they do not weatherize a home and they do not install heat pumps, there will be a fee for the fossil fuel that they sell. For fossil fuel dealers that do uh, produce weatherization work and heat pump installations, they'll have credits. So they will be selling fossil fuel at a lower rate than other people who do not make any contribution towards climate change. I see, I see. So it's a, it's really about incentivizing mm -hmm. uh, a move towards towards um, uh, more efficient fossil fuel usage, um, and, and placing that um, that task on the fuel dealers to to really take advantage of of this opportunity to uh, incentivize fuel pump and and uh, home energy improvements. Excellent, excellent. Um, let's move on to a topic that has dominated the national news. Uh, all the way up to the Supreme Court for the last couple of weeks, and that is um, the so-called abortion drug, mefepristone. Um, I understand that the legislature has taken some action relative to the availability of that drug for women in, and for healthcare providers in Vermont during this kind of tenuous time for the medication. Can you speak to what uh, what happened last week? Yes, so uh, a bill came forth um, to that will enable us to continue providing this service to Vermonters. It will keep our healthcare providers safe in doing so. And most importantly, on the House floor, it came up a number of times that there was concerns about mithapristone being available in vending machines. And that is not true. Um, we still will provide um, condoms and other types of, of reproductive assistance in vending machines, um, but certainly not a drug that needs to be administered uh, mm -hmm. by a healthcare professional and provider. And that's a rumor that it had taken uh, taken hold in some some circles that it was somehow available in vending machines. That's 
that's astounding considering it's a prescription medication. Um, yes, yes. Well, there's language in the bill regarding vending machines and reproductive um assistance. Mm -hmm. And so I think then it was just assumed that another part of the bill that had to do with mythopristone, um, you know, was somehow related to that. You know, it's very challenging in the legislature when a bill is, you know, 35 to 100 pages long. And we as legislators need to understand all of it, even though we're not in that committee listening to, to testimony. And and it can be challenging. So I hope um, that it was just one of those instances, but it uh, it was brought up a number of times. So. Wow. Wow. Well, that's, that, that, that's intriguing. That's intriguing. Well, I'm pleased to hear that the uh, legislature has taken action, at least for the time being, while this issue wends its way through the, um, through the courts uh, to assure that uh, Vermonters will continue to have access to Mifepristone. So... Uh, that's that's excellent to hear, and and uh, thirdly, let's move on to um, a piece of legislation and a topic that we've discussed numerous times here, and that is now moving through um, through the House and uh, on to hope for finalization. And that is child care legislation. Uh, mm -hmm. I understand that's moved into uh, the committee you serve on uh, this past week. Is that correct? That is correct. So when it, it arrived to us on Friday morning, but we have started to take some testimony so that we can hear different responses because we will need to vote this out of our committee by Wednesday. So we essentially have tomorrow and Wednesday morning to, to hear the finalization of testimony and to be able to um, talk about what our changes will be and then have legislative council incorporate them into the bill. Now, being the education committee, we have no jurisdiction in, in child care, birth to three, but we do have jurisdiction when it comes to pre-kindergarten. And that is, that's the biggest challenge. So we really do want to support a mixed delivery system. There's absolutely not enough infrastructure available in the state to automatically uh, have pre-K happen for even simply just four-year-olds in any extremely fast time period. But what's come up, not just through this interim secretary of education, Heather Boucher, but in other testimony, that it is not the right way to go from the child development perspective to separate three and four-year-olds. Mm -hmm. And what the Senate's bill came forth with was, and, and the House supported that, was to have just four-year-olds be in the public sector and then keep three-year-olds completely out of pre-K programming at all and simply in the child care sector. Now, that's not to say that child care providers do not educate children. They do, but um, they won't be mandated and licensed through the agency of education if this if this was enacted in this particular way. Mm -hmm. So, you know, in the next day and a half, we will discuss whether or not we should study the implementation of a mixed delivery with three and four-year-olds, with just four-year-olds. And then to that degree, there is a lot of financing. Uh, so House Ways and Means is looking at uh, taxes for uh, personal income and also for corporations. And that is what they're uh, planning to use to fund child care. And we're talking $90 million. So it's no small, uh, it's no small item financially. But one thing that the House Education Committee is very keen upon is that we have a pupil weight that, and this weight is going to come forth in this next school year. And the weight for a pre-K student is negative five, four. So basically a pre-K student gets half the amount of money to be educated in the public school system as a kindergarten student, which has a weight of one. And that means that pre-K in the public school is for the fiscal year 24 will be about $3,700 per year. 
and that covers the 10 hours. But as you know, most schools that offer pre-K don't just have you show up for two hours a day. It's usually a half day or a full day. So the education committee is pushing to have a weight of one because it's less expensive to bring that child into the public school system with a weight of one than it is even mostly in the in the private uh, sector. So we just want to make sure that public education and private sector are getting equal uh, access, benefit, and expansion capacity. Wow, uh, a complicated process, and you've got a you've got a <laughs> day and a half to uh, to wade through it and come up with a final piece of legislation that um, that addresses these issues and 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 then moves on, um, hopefully for approval this session. Yes. Tasha, as always, it's been great to speak with you. Uh, busy times for you, so I won't keep you any longer uh, today, but um, greatly appreciate your sharing updates on, on S5, on Mifepristone, and on the child care legislation with, uh, with our viewers this week. And we'll look forward to seeing you in another week. Excellent. Learn what's gone on in the, legis in the legislature in the days ahead. Thanks so much. Thank you. Have a great week. <laughs>